It seems to me that more people than ever are showing interest in buying vintage hi-fi components. What could be the reason for this surge? Well, I believe that enthusiasts are seeking value for the money. A decent new stereophonic system may cost you a few thousand dollars, whereas a comparable older system from the 70s, 80s, or 90s could cost you only a fraction of that. Along with all of that, vintage gear is unbelievably interesting and cool. Nothing made today really looks or sounds anything like those 1960s and 1970s receivers and turntables, or speakers and cassette decks from the 1980s. 1990s CD players and amplifiers are pretty hard to beat as well. But are there risks and potential pitfalls of such a move? Of course. If you are not really a risk taker and are only comfortable with buying the latest new device sealed in the box, returnable with a full warranty, then go watch videos by Andrew Robinson, Steve the Audiophiliac, or the British Audiophile. But if you enjoy the risk and rewards of the hunt and are not scared of occasionally bringing home something that disappoints, then keep watching. I am certainly not claiming to be a definitive expert and as because I know there is plenty that I don't know and still need to learn. Like many aspects in life, just when you believe you've got things pretty much figured out, Reality steps in and teaches you that you actually have very little figured out and it's back to the drawing board. Now for this video, I have combined the knowledge that I have personally accumulated over time with the wisdom contributed by many other knowledgeable individuals. In order to guide anyone interested in exploring the universe, the amazing universe of vintage or used audio components. Now, after compiling and looking at the various aspects of this topic, I saw that I could kind of break it down into five comprehensive categories. And this will hopefully guide and assist you in finding and acquiring many wonderful old receivers amplifiers, speakers, turntables, CD players, and cassette decks, whatever. So here it is. My Own Devices presents five expert tips for buying vintage audio components. Yeah, but you know, I gotta get out of here and I'm gonna go outside. Cosmetic condition. Now, that is extremely important. And generally speaking, fixing damage to the exterior of a component is far more challenging than repairing the parts on the inside. You know, talking about bent face plates, cracked front glass or plastic windows, rust, drilled holes, water damage, missing buttons and knobs, deep gouges, they're all very undesirable. And obviously, they can be considered definite signs of abuse and neglect. So in general, I would much, much rather have a clean, non-functioning component than a beat-up one that works. Don't necessarily let superficial dust, dirt, or even grease scare you off. They can usually be effectively cleaned up with a bit of effort. Be aware that if you buy a unit with, a, with broken or missing exterior pieces that need replacing, you may have to wait a very long time before something turns up on eBay, especially on lesser known brands and models and very high-end models and things that are generally sold in limited or low quantities. And sometimes they never show up at all. They call those items unobtainium, right? And remember, some of the 
Inside electronic parts can be difficult to find as well, in particular proprietary parts that are just made by that manufacturer that are, that are very unique, or transistors or IC chips that, have been, that are burnt out and have been out of production for decades and are almost impossible to obtain. But ideally, you want to find a piece of gear that appears to have been looked after. And you may avoid those listings that state, visible damage doesn't affect sound quality. Those are ones you might want to avoid. Always assume your vintage purchase will require some servicing. Now there are the rare occasion that you can get extremely lucky and your newly acquired component will work flawlessly for months or even years. And I find that speakers are the most reliable components. As long as they're undamaged and functioning properly and sound good when you buy them. They're the least problematic component from my experience. You don't want to mess up your TikTok. It's not TikTok. It's YouTube. Oh, YouTube. Okay. Yeah. Same, same thing almost. All right. Old cassette decks and CD players are the most vulnerable to dirt age and wear related mechanical issues. You know those rubber belts and plastic cogs often disintegrate over time and commonly require replacing. Turntables, especially automatic ones, are prone to similar mechanical issues with all their moving parts. And I always assume that the included cartridge stylus is worn out when I get it. You should expect that receivers and amps, you know, components that generate a lot of heat will require servicing of some kind. Sometimes you're able to thoroughly audition the component, but very often you're meeting in the seller's garage, a storage unit, or in a parking lot. And you must use your, you must use your eyeballs and take the seller's word that it works okay. On several occasions, I've auditioned and inspected components that appeared okay, only to discover issues later after getting it home and using them for a few hours. If you can competently repair electronics yourself, you have a huge advantage when purchasing these old models. But if you don't live within a reasonable distance from an honest and competent service technician, you'll have to ship your component, serve it to a service tech, which could add tremendous additional expense. And because those guys aren't cheap and neither is shipping. I hope I can, you guys can hear this with all this wind blowing. Another option is to buy a fully restored component. And by fully restored, I mean it's got new capacitors, transistors, resistors. It's been, they've all been checked and replaced and it's been fully cleaned and lubricated and the knobs and switches have all been cleaned, new belts, new gears, light bulbs, the works. And as you can imagine, you're going to pay significantly more for a fully restored unit. Finding vintage gear. Now, I usually pursue audio gear that's listed locally, that I can pick up in person from the seller. And my two go-to websites are Craigslist and Facebook Marketplace. Now, searching on Craigslist is simple, clean, and pretty straightforward. Facebook Marketplace is okay, and can be more helpful because you can actually look up the seller's Facebook profile and perhaps glean something useful there. There are also Facebook groups that you can join that feature hi-fi gear for sale by group members, but they're usually not local. Facebook also has local swip swap groups that you can search. Now, the other thing about Facebook is that it can also be really annoying because it mixes the local listings with paid advertisements and long distance items that require shipping and payments through Facebook so they can collect fees. So it requires a bit more effort to locate the things you're looking for. The upsides of local pickup are, you obviously, you know, you obviously get to save on shipping costs. It's safe and it avoids potential damage from shipping. You get to meet the seller and sometimes make friends with them. 
And you also see the environment that the gear is kept in. And there's also potential for other available things to buy. Now the downsides might be, I guess, limited selection. Sometimes you gotta drive a ways to get something. It's usually non-returnable, there's no warranty, and you do sometimes encounter strange sellers and weird hoarder environments. Websites that also are good are like eBay and Audiogon, US Audio Mart, ShopGoodwill.com, and Nextdoor. Some sellers may be near you and offer local pickup, and, but you're kind of limited in your haggling opportunities there, but they often have a wide selection, good choice, some, and some good deals. And you can also get purchase protection from crooked sellers. Shipping can be expensive, and there's also a risk of damage during shipping if the shipper is careless or inexperienced in shipping this kind of thing. Now, longer transaction times between the end of auction and when the item arrives is also very, very common. Now, traditional thrift stores, charity shops, I'm not a big fan of those because it's been years since I've seen anything in there that was worthwhile. There, I've hear, I hear there's still great deals can be found in there, but the prices are rising and they're definitely not as good as they used to be. And I've heard that Goodwill sends the good stuff to their online auction service. Now, garage sales, they're, I'm not, I don't like those much either. Very time consuming, I get frustrated, I'm driving for miles and wasting my whole Saturday morning driving around finding nothing. Estate sales, they can be time consuming and they could be sometimes good, but once again, you gotta get there early or you're gonna miss out. You can also try some local vintage dealers who have actually a shop front. And those are pretty good because you can get some advice there. They have good auditioning environment setups you got a good decent selection, they'll give, probably give you a warranty and they'll service it and you can return it and you can build relationships with the, with the salesman. But the downside is you're going to pay full retail price for something you get from a store. What is it worth? Now, this is huge and not always easy. One of the big advantages of vintage gear is the potential of tremendous value. The opportunity to buy components at a fraction of the original cost is what gets vintage enthusiasts into a feverish, demented, uncontrolled frenzy. And it's not just for the sheer thrill of scoring a great deal, but to be able to brag about it later to their buddies. I've heard many tales of incredible thrift store, dumpster, garage sale, and sidewalk finds. Some of them I believe, some I don't. Obviously, how much to spend is a very subjective proposition. Do you have a modest, limited budget, or do you have deeper pockets? What's your goal? To start out swinging for the fences, or to go more cautiously and climb the upgrade ladder, learning along the way? Now let's say you're scrolling through some online listings and suddenly something catches your eye. A turntable, a receiver, a pair of speakers. And now you're familiar with the brand and maybe even the model. And the price appears reasonable, but how do you know if it's underpriced or overpriced or just about right? eBay listings can help, especially with popular brands. Remember, always check the actual sold prices because the asking prices are often grossly inflated. Now check the condition, if they're fully functional or non-functional or have issues when you're checking the prices. Looking up the years that the unit was manufactured and the original MSRP can be helpful and useful, especially during negotiation. You say, hey, this thing is 20 years old. You're crazy, that price. Another good place to look or to seek advice is on online hi-fi forums. They often have special sections where values can be discussed in a helpful, constructive manner. And there's lots of people on there who are very happy to give you some uh, 
experience and advice on this topic. Now, my personal experiences vary. I've haggled with a seller over a difference of $10 or $20, and other times I just said, screw it, I want this thing now, and I'll pay what they're asking. It can get emotional, but remember, once that happens, you're not likely going to get a good deal. The art of haggling is vital. If you believe the item is priced too high, make an offer that you believe is more reasonable and include your reasons. Also, check and see how long the item has been listed for. The seller could be more open to negotiation at a much lower price if it's up there for a long time. Now, factor in the minimum cost of service and repairs into the offer. I usually go in at least $100 below asking in, a, in an all original device, unless it's really, really cheap. Haggling may require a little bit of back and forth, but remain calm and respectful. Give clear and reasonable reasons on why you are offering them less and avoid BSing. A lot of sellers don't realize that repairs are a major issue. Now, when I negotiate or haggle, I prefer texting. It's straightforward and less emotional than a phone conversation or, nego or negotiating in person. Now, if you're a people person and think you can work your magic with the personal touch, try that. But I like to have the price decided and agreed upon before I pick it up. Always inquire if they have the original boxes, manuals, accessories, and receipts. Look around the room discreetly and ask if they have anything else to sell. Often, you'll be surprised, they'll throw in a few records or CDs, some decent inter interconnects, speaker wires, surge protectors, phono cartridges. All you got to do is ask. And once you decide you want it, hand over the money promptly. Close the deal before they change their mind. Be patient, but be prepared to act quickly. To find a good deal, you must be searching online daily several times a day. Save your searches, like speakers, receivers, turntable, etc. I suggest you have some idea what you're looking for and a budget. When you really find something you like and the price is right and decide that you want it, move on it quickly. The same thing applies at garage sales, estate sales, or thrift stores. If you see something you want, grab it before somebody else does. Now, you have your phone with you, hopefully, and the, the web is an amazing resource. Use Google to look up the model on offer, get the basic facts, the specs, the age, history, country of origin, what it's worth, find reviews, audio forum comments, videos of it in use, and even one showing someone repairing it. It can be very helpful. The better the deal, the more decisively you must act. Contact the seller with a question and or an offer. I've seen some amazing deals that I missed by just a matter of minutes. Remember, you're not the only one out there looking. Now, if you know for sure that it's an amazing, incredible deal, contact them and see if they'll accept a quick holding deposit or a full payment through PayPal or another online payment service. Get that baby locked up to discourage the seller from entertaining other offers. Note of warning, if you are bidding in an auction style listing on eBay or Shop Goodwill like that, it's so easy to get caught up in the final minutes and seconds because you just want to win and you know emotion goes, <laughs> everything, logic goes out the window and it easily leads to paying too much for something. I know, I've done it. Over time, you will acquire enough experience and wisdom to spot the desirable gear and deals. And remember, you will make a few mistakes along the way. It's okay. It's how you learn. Now, be patient. The deals can appear at any time. You can go weeks with nothing happening at all, and then suddenly there are two or three genuine scores that you want to act on. So be ready. Always have some cash on hand, maybe three, four hundred dollars. 
The final point I'd like to make on this subject is that your goal when buying vintage or used gear should be to pay about half or less of its market value. And this means you can make a bit of a profit when you do eventually sell it, or at least break even, not lose money. And that's including the costs of possible servicing and repairs. Think about it. You may actually find it comforting to know that you can purchase something, get it serviced, use and enjoy it for a period of time, and then sell it without losing money or even making back a little bit extra. Now, do I occasionally lose money on a deal? Sadly, yes, but I believe I'm very much ahead of the game at this point. So, no, no, really, I am. I'm not, I'm not joking. I am ahead. 